Okay. Now we're ready for the oversight portion of the hearing. Once again, I'm Councilmember Ijanik Miller, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, chair of Committee on Women and Gender Equity, for joining me in holding this important hearing, uh, hearing topic this afternoon. Local Law 18 of 2019, or the city's pay equity law, was passed by the council on December 20th of 18. It was returned and unsigned by the mayor and enacted into law on January 20 of 2019. The law's purpose is to find and eliminate any instances of pay disparity within the city's workforce. It requires that the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, also known as MOTA, compile an annual report of data gathered from every city agency on gender, ethics, and racial data across different pay ranges. To do this, every city agency, every city agency is first required to report to this data to DCAS on things such as agency, employment, start date, civil service title, salary range, career levels, base salary, gender, racial group, ethnicity, and worker status, full-time, seasonal, or part-time. This first benchmark was to, to become no later, to come no later than November 30th of 2019, and will continue on November 30th annually thereafter. Next, DCAS will submit this collected data to MOTA. MOTA is required to compile the data from each city agency into a report with, to, to show the frequency, full-time, part-time, seasonal employees by agency, EEO, full job group, pay band, racial group, and gender. This report, this report will be sent to the mayors and the speaker and posted publicly on MOTA's website on Open New York website. In order for the council to ensure that this report is useful and indexing in, in, indexes existing or non-existent disparities within the city's workforce, the law provides for a 90-day window for the city council to, to access an employment level data for all city workers to perform its own analysis. Since the first benchmark date of November 30th has just passed, the committee would like to, have, to hear from the administration about the progress of implementation of this landmark legislation. Specifically, we would like to examine if the first deadline has been successfully met, what problems have arisen in meeting these deadlines and future deadlines, and what remedial steps are taken or being taken to ensure compliance and successful implementation of the law. In addition, the committees would like to ensure that the future deadlines, including February 28th of 2020, April 29th of 2020, and May 31st of 2020 will be met. As the race and gender wage gap still exists within New York City, it is important to ensure that city is act act actively addressing the issues within the city agencies and its workforce. I look forward to hearing from the administration on the progress of the implementation of Local Law 18 of 2019. Uh, I want to thank my staff, Brandon Clark, Ali Vasulinajad, the great Joe Goldblum. In addition, I'd like to thank council staff, Nusat, Malcolm, Kevin, and Kendall, and Elizabeth. Um, we're going to hear from the bill's uh, sponsor, Majority Leader Laurie Cumbo, and we and, and first I'd like to turn it over to my co-chair uh, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Councilmember Miller. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Thank you to everyone who's joining us for this incredibly important hearing on the implementation of the city's pay equity law. Today we are taking a critical step as we prepare for an unprecedented analysis of salary parity within the largest workforce in New York City, municipal employees. Even in this heavily unionized public sector, we have found that issues of wage inequity um, it continues and persists. One profound manifestation of salary inequity is obviously the gender pay gap, a clear product of structural sexism. 
In 2018, white women earned 85% of what men earned, up from 80% last year. But this gap is much wider for women of color. And while the gap has narrowed for white women since 1980, it has re remained stable over the past 15 years for women of color. This past April 2nd marked the 23rd year of the National Equal Pay Day, which was created to raise public awareness around the gender pay gap. Each year, a date is chosen which re represents how far into the year women must work in order to earn what men earned on average from the previous year. While April 2nd was the date for women on average, black women's equal pay day fell months later on August 22nd, and Latina equal pay day even later, November 20th. Now we have an opportunity to find out what is going on in our own backyard, our municipal government. Now, according to the New York Daily News, uh, which published an article just yesterday, Speaker Johnson has achieved gender pay equity for our city council central staff. And I applaud him for this intentional effort. And now we need to extend that success from central staff into legislators' own individual offices. Lastly, while readily available data on earnings and the wage gap are presented within a gender binary, transgender and gender expansive people are similarly adversely impacted due to their gender identity and or expression a fact that is further impacted for TGNCNB individuals of color. This all serves to highlight the importance of the city's pay equity law sponsored by council member Lori Cumbo, majority leader, now majority leader Cumbo, uh, which council member Miller discussed in his opening remarks. Understanding pay data and what is driving the discrepancies will allow the city to better address this fundamental issue. I'm looking forward to hearing from DCAS and the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics about the implementation of this law and next steps to achieve a more equitable New York City. I am disappointed, however, that the Commission on Gender Equity is not testifying today. Women work so hard to get to the table, to have a seat at the table. And I would have loved from the Commission on Gender Equity to today testify about the importance of this legislation, about the importance of the findings, and about their drive to make sure that we can, that this city will implement what is needed to get to gender pay parity. I would like to thank Marisa Mock, my Chief of Staff, Madhuri uh, Shukla, my Legislative Director, and Committee Staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Jaisri Ganapathy, my Legislative Counsel, Chloe Rivera, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst, and Monica People, uh, Financial Analyst. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the committee members who are present, uh, my committee members who are present, we turn on. Have you already? <laughs> OK. And everyone now. else who is here, <laughs> Council Member Danny Drum and um, Eric Ulrich from Queens, Council Members Farrah Lewis uh, from Brooklyn, and Council Member Cumbo from Brooklyn, and Council Member Adrian Adams also from Queens. I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague to continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now we're going to hear from the bill's sponsor, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. 
Thank you. I'll be brief. I'm a little under the weather, but I just wanted to uh, briefly thank our co-chairs, uh, Councilmember Danique Miller and Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. This is a long time coming, but when I look out at all of you, I especially just want to recognize uh, the dynamic men and women of CWA 1180. You all are phenomenal. Every time I see uh, red coats in the room, I grow about 10 feet and feel so much stronger because of your dedication and your leadership. And we are essentially here because of their leadership, for their courage and their tenacity for filing the original lawsuit and the courage that it took in order to do that. And because of the work that each and every one of you have done, we are here today at this particular moment because as Councilmember Helen Rosenthal stated so eloquently, when we look at the dynamics, particularly um, speaking as an African-American woman, I know that African-American women have to work a whole year and then until the month of August just to make what their white male counterparts make. And so we in the city council, we pass lots of phenomenal and incredible legislation, but it's all about how that legislation is actually being enforced and that's what we're really here to talk about today. This was an incredible groundbreaking piece of legislation that we were able to collectively work towards, but if this isn't being adhered to by all of our city agencies, if we are not implementing this legislation, if the information and the data is not effectively um, communicated to the individuals that need this information, then this legislation will not have the teeth that it was originally intended to have. So I certainly want to thank all of you because sometimes after the legislation, everybody goes away. But the fact that you all are still here and continuing to fight is so important because often in, in many industries where pay disparities are the greatest, you show me a, a space and a place where pay disparity is the greatest and I'll show you where black, Latino, and Asian women um, are working. And so I thank all of you for being here. I want to thank uh, Yetta Curlin for her work um, in getting us here, Sebastian Levinson, um, and everyone that has worked really hard. I want to thank Gloria Middleton, who has continued to carry this charge at the forefront um, and was uh, given so much inspiration by author Chiliotis as well, who have continued to carry this mantle and to bring us forward. So I salute you. I thank you for your leadership, thank you for your courage and your tenacity, and for bringing this forward, because as women of color, you are really creating a space of equality for every single New Yorker. And so the pay equity uh, fight will really be uh, introduced and launched on the backs particularly of black and brown women, but the entire city will benefit from your efforts. And as a uh, a, a new mom raising a son in the city of New York and the head of a household, I really understand now why this issue is so critical and important. Daycare is not cheap. The cost of living is not cheap in the city of New York. Uh, uh, daycare plus after daycare and weekend care is really expensive. So I understand the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm so pleased that you all are here today to carry this mantle forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, this is a, a hearing a, about oversight, and we look forward to hearing from the administration about um, uh, compliance and hopefully not the lack thereof, but how we move forward and, and making sure that this is the tool that we legislate and, and, and hope that it would be moving forward with that. I'm going to, uh, we have Barbara Danaber Danaberg from DCAS and Kelly Jen from MOTA. And they're gonna be sworn in now by council before their testimony. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Oh. 
Good afternoon, Chairs Miller and Rosenthal, and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. I'm Barbara Dannenberg. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Human Capital at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, and I am joined today by my colleague, Kelly Jin, Chief Analytics Officer for the City of New York, and also the Director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the city's role in Local Law 18 of 2019, which requires DCAS to collect information relevant to pay and employment equity and for the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics to make the data available to the City Council. A report will also be provided to the Mayor and Council with aggregate data from each agency showing the frequency of full-time, part-time, and seasonal employees by agency, EEO4 group, pay band, racial group, ethnicity, and gender. This administration is committed to improving equity throughout the city and applauds the council to for their work in addressing issues of pay and employment equity. Since 2014, this administration has made tremendous strides in improving workplace equity. In June of 2015, Mayor de Blasio issued Executive Order 10, forming the first ever Commission on Gender Equity which works to expand opportunities for New Yorkers regardless of sex, gender, or sexual orientation. In January of 2016, the mayor enacted Personnel Order 2016-1, which provided managerial and original jurisdiction employees with six weeks of paid time off for maternity, paternity, adoption, and foster care leave. In March of 2016, Executive Order 16 was issued to ensure that city agencies allow employees and the public to use single-sex city facilities consistent with their gender identity. Also in 2016, in December, the mayor issued Executive Order 21, which prohibits city agencies from inquiring about an applicant's salary history, thus removing a persistent barrier to equitable pay. Finally, in January of 2019, Thanks to the collaboration between the Office of Labor, Re Labor Relations and our labor partners, the city opted in to New York State's Paid Family Leave Program, which enables eligible represented employees up to 10 weeks of leave paid at 55% of their salary in 2019 and up to 10 weeks of paid leave at 60% of their salary in 2020 to care for a newborn, foster, or adopted child, family members who are ill, or to provide assistance to family members on military deployment. As a continuation of citywide efforts to address pay and employment equity, DCAS has maintained collaboration with city agencies over the last several months to meet the requirements set forth in Local Law 18. The majority of employment data requested in this local law was extracted from our citywide <clears throat> New York City Automated Personnel System database, NETCAPS. This includes employee history profile information, such as civil service titles and levels, and current agency. The available data includes agencies in this NICAPS database only and does not include information from agencies including New York City Transit, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, New York City Health and Hospitals, the School Construction Authority, the Department of Education, pedagogical employees, and other agencies that are not covered by the local law. I am pleased to report that DCAS has completed collecting this data within the November 30th deadline. The department is currently working with MODA to review a sample file, a data dictionary, and several reference tables. DCAS is actively in discussion with MODA to answer questions raised based on the sample file, and we look forward to working with MODA and the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, do it, on establishing a secure file transfer process for the main file. We are confident that we will be able to transition this data to MODA within 90 days of the November 30th benchmark. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the work that DCAS has done in this area. I would now like to turn it over to my colleague, Kelly Jin from MODA, for further comments. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Miller and Rosenthal and members of the Civil Service and Labor and Women and Gender Equity Committees. My name is Kelly Jin, uh, and I am the Chief Analytics Officer for the City of New York, as well as the Director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Thank you for the opportunity today to testify on the status of implementation of Local Law 18 of 2019. 
The Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, also known as MODA, which was established by executive order in 2013 and codified in the city charter in 2018, supports city agencies in applying strategic analytical thinking to data in order to deliver services more equitably and effectively and to increase operational transparency. Our mission is to use data analytics to help city agencies deliver services more efficiently, facilitate citywide data operations, and implement the city's open data law. MODA is committed to government transparency and sharing agency data of interest with New Yorkers publicly, as permitted by law through the open data program. MODA also takes the protection of sensitive data and information very seriously and has established best practices, including entering into memoranda of understanding and data sharing agreements with city agencies and other partners where necessary. These agreements provide legal, privacy, and security protocols for responsible data transfer, storage, retention, and data access, among other important considerations. Local Law 18 of 2019 tasks MODA with three responsibilities on an annual basis. The first is to make NYC's municipal workforce data reflecting individual employment and pay history available to the City Council for 90 days. The second is to issue a report of select relevant data in an aggregated form. And the third is to provide an analysis of these data elements to identify any disparities over time subsequent to the release of the second annual report. In complying with these mandates, MODA must also work to ensure that consistent with legal requirements and city privacy and security policies that inform its best practices to date, the privacy of the personally identifiable information of New York City's municipal workforce is protected at all stages of the implementation of Local Law 18, from the transfer of employment history profiles and salary data between city agencies to the aggregation and analysis of the data by MODA data scientists to sharing this analysis with the public. As you may know, large data projects like this are not simple and take significant work and resources to complete. In accordance with Local Law 18, MODA anticipates receiving the first set of employee history profile data from DCAS by no later than February uh, 28, 2020. MODA has assigned half of its team to the task of timely compliance with this law in anticipation of receiving a large sensitive data set. Uh, MODA's project team has assigned two data scientists, a project manager, a policy analyst, and its data operations manager to this project. The team is being overseen by me. DCAS and MODA are in regular communication with one another and have been holding weekly meetings regarding overall coordination and scheduling around compliance with Local Law 18. We are currently preparing for the forthcoming DCAS to MODA data transfer with discussions around the complex data dictionaries and other elements such as metadata and the technical relationships of the underlying categories of data elements. Because of the privacy implications involved in disclosing among city agencies the numerous individually identifying data elements mandated by Local Law 18, this data transfer requires the development and execution of a data sharing agreement among the relevant agencies to memorialize the privacy and security protocols necessary for, to ensure appropriate protection of employees' privacy and security of the data itself. MODA has also been engaged in weekly project meetings with the Mayor's Office of Operations, their General Counsel, and the Office of the Chief Privacy Officer to move this process forward in a responsible manner. Upon receipt of the relevant employment and pay history data, MODA will have until April 28th, 2020 to make the data available to City Council for 90 days through a technically secure means of access. Before such access is provided as a standard practice, MODA anticipates entering into a formal legal data sharing agreement with the Council to establish and memorialize the secure technical arrangement for the data access and protocols to ensure that the privacy of the personal information of New York City's municipal workforce is protected. 
MOTA will then issue the first annual report uh, for employment and pay data from the employee history profiles, which is on track for its deadline in late spring 2020. Local Law 18 prescribes the format and contents of this aggregated data report and requires the data to be in the format that prevents the disclosure of certain sensitive information, including the racial group, ethnicity, or gender of any employee. We are carefully managing the schedule and committed to timely implementation. MOTA is confident at this stage that it will be able to meet all of the requirements and looks forward to working together with relevant agencies and council colleagues to conduct this work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. So I, I would say from, from uh, both agencies, from Motor and DCAS, that um, based on the testimony that you are more than sufficiently aware of the importance of the uh, implementation and execution of Local Law 18 and that the agencies have been working collaboratively to ensure that implementation uh, is seamless. Um, but that does not happen unless we have uh, participation from, from each agency. So I, I want to begin um, by asking um, if all agencies that are required are currently in compliance with the, uh, the, the, the our November 30th um, portion of the law? Yes, hi. Um, yes, uh, all agencies have uh, turned over their data to DCAS and uh, to the extent that the data was available to them. Um, and just to back up a little bit, uh, prior to this transfer of the data, DCAS worked with all of the city agencies in order to encourage um, employees to um, fill in and complete the voluntary information and also so that agencies can be sh could be sure to um, enter information such as business title. So, so with, um, we, we did our best to work with city agencies to ensure that this information transfer was as robust as possible. So with the additional assistance, you're saying that every agency that was required has um, given the uh, required uh, data, has been turned over to, to, to DCAS? Yes, they have. Right. Okay. And in, in terms of DCAS's responsibility, um, are you comfortable that, that you will meet your upcoming benchmark? Um, and, and delivering the information to MOTA and that you've worked in, that that collaboration is ensuring a, a smooth and, and seamless um, transition of information so that the actual implementation of 18 is happening? Yeah, so as we indicated um, in our testimonies, uh, both MOTA and DCAS have been working uh, very closely together to ensure that we do meet these uh, benchmark deadlines um, and for the transfer of this data. And, and, and from a MOTA perspective, right now you're just in, you, 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 I wouldn't say that you're in a holding pattern because obviously you, you're communicating, but you're limited to what can be done until you're an actual receipt. Um, but you have done everything that you need to do in terms of receiving the information you're prepared to move forward yes, upon receipt of the information. Yes, as, as noted uh, in our collective testimonies, there is um, quite a, a bit of preparation work that needs to happen um, to make sure that we have uh, the technical infrastructure and also uh, the right governance and data sharing agreements in place before that transfer happens. And so um, in our, our work with DCAS, they are ready to uh, send the data, but we do need to work on the protocols for receiving the data. So in, during the, the course of this obvious communication, has there been any concerns raised and or addressed as we move forward? And are, are, we, uh, are you confident that any concerns that may have been raised will be addressed in time for this to uh, be as seamless as we hope it to be? So as, as we began our work together several months ago, um, we are confident that if any roadblocks or issues are raised during this process that we uh, will have the protocol set in place in order to address them in time to meet, meet these deadlines.
pass it over to my colleague, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Williams, and thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for your super technical um, testimony. I mean, it, what I'm hearing from this is that from a, you know, literally we need these pieces of data, we're collecting these pieces of data, turning it over to Moda, who will analyze these pieces of data. It sounds like that's working, working, right? But how about from a qualitative point of view? And one of the things you mentioned is some agencies aren't able to produce all the data. Who's, who's reviewing that? and making a decision about, well, we have to push that agency harder to get that information, or, eh, we can let this or that go. Who, who's, who's thinking about it holistically from the point of view of achieving pay equity? So, so DCAS definitely takes that holistic view of um, employment equity, and we, um, as I indicated earlier, we had been working with agencies to ensure that this data file was as robust and as inclusive as possible. So can you tell um, so me both what's on missing? on the employee end and also on uh, the HR department end. So what's missing? Oh, um, I wouldn't say that anything is missing, I would say that some agencies, you know, for example, NYPD does not use business title, right? So if you're a police officer, your civil service title is police officer, your office title is police officer. So you wouldn't see, you know, any, any um, interesting data as far as that goes. Um, but yes, we- But uh, then, we so how do you that meld that into the other data when you're looking at gaps? How, how have you decided to address that issue? So we firmly believe that um, our work with the agencies has produced um, the best um, and most robust information that we, uh, the city has, so yes. So, so how are you dealing with the NYPD issue? I wouldn't consider that an issue. Um, you know, if an agency has a civil service title and an office title that are similar or the same, um, you know, those fields will be f will be completed, but you won't see, you know, any sort of um, interesting um, information within the data, or you won't see um, any differences between those two fields for those agencies. And that's just an example. I, I so, think, what does that tell us? I think just to speak on the the data front here, the um, what is really important about the underlying? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what is really important about the underlying data elements is that we are providing the context behind the data capture, and uh, as as Deputy Commissioner Dannenberg already noted, that that um, is provided in addition to this information, as we know that there are 22 data elements in there. So providing the data about the data, if you will, is an important part of this work. Um, what other agencies don't have the data in the format that you're looking for? Well, every agency um, submitted the data in the format that we were looking for. Um, I'm just using that as an example of a field that may not be as robust as others. Um, also, um, some of the fields are to be completed um, voluntarily by employees. And, you know, as much as we did encourage employees to complete these fields, we certainly couldn't um, ensure that every employee completed those fields. So what's an example of a field that's voluntary? Highest level of education. Highest level of education. That's not in a form somewhere. So the way that the city collects data um, from applicants or current city employees, uh, we know that they meet the educational requirements for the title that they are employed in. However, um, that certainly doesn't preclude employees from having either, you know, a higher level of education um, within a certain area or while they're working for us um, to, uh, to go out and seek um, additional degrees or certification. And if they don't indicate that within their um, employee history profile, uh, we certainly wouldn't be able to capture that information. So what percent were not, did, did how, what percent chose not to provide that information? I don't have that information with me. I'm not sure that that was um, part of what DCAS captured, but I can certainly look into that. 
I don't understand your I, answer. I'm looking at the percentages, but I can certainly look to see if we have that information for you. So how many people answered the question? Well, we requested it of all city employees. So the entire data, the data file contains information for every city employee. How many that's is covered that? Under this local What's law. the total? I, I wouldn't know that off the top of my head. You don't know the total yeah, number? But I, I can certainly get you that information wait, on the data wait, file. Wait, wait, wait. We're at a hearing discussing data for a report, and you're the data expert. So I'm asking you just a really basic question. What's the N? What, so what's the denominator? Right. So, so DCAS's work within the, uh, the confines of this local law was to collect the data and to make the data accessible to MODA. So you didn't it, take the time to count or look at the total. You know by, you sort of ran, so as you got data from an agency, you passed it over, and you never took the time to collect what the total is. So now that we have all the data, what's the total number of employees? So as, as referenced in the testimony, um, the data as per received from agencies to DCAS was that uh, milestone was at the end of November and MODA anticipates receiving. I really can't hear you. So you have information as of November and the total is? Uh, MODA will not be receiving the uh, underlying raw data until um, February. So I'm sorry, so DCAS has the total. DCAS has the data, so yes. But we you have, didn't total it up. That's correct. Do you so know under, the number by agency? Under the um, purview of Local Law 18, DCAS was tasked with collecting this data and also um, encouraging um, the agencies and employees to um, complete the required data fields. Do you somewhere in your office, if not here with you now, have the number of um, the, the just the basic data of how many people by agency, right? How many people are in the workforce by agency? And then how many people answered the voluntary questions by question? And then I imagine DCAS for the mandatory information you already had that data, so it's not that you're asking people. Right. So in your office, do you have this very simplistic overall set of numbers? So um, to answer your question, yes, of course, DCAS has the total number of employees. Um, I'm, sur I'm sure we can aggregate the number of employees that are covered under this particular local law. Um, however, we have not been tasked with analyzing the data, so an analysis of, or comparison of that data, we have the raw data set. So, um, you know, usually raw the first part data of your sets have provide. a total at the bottom. I don't, I don't mean to be snarky, so let me just express it's really disappointing to me that you've collected all the raw data and you don't know totals. That's not specific personal private data. I'm not asking about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine you know what your data set is. And all I'm asking, and, and so I hope you can send it over afterwards. Um, so according to the law, you're, you don't have to collect information that's in your purview about school construction authority, uh, health and hospitals, et cetera. Why don't you just do it voluntarily? You have the data, no? Well, for uh, the examples that you raised, New York City Health and Hospitals and for School Construction Authority, we actually do not have their, their data because they don't use our um, automated personnel system. Mm -hmm. so, to the extent, um, yeah, so maybe this is a question them. for the administration, not you, because you're just doing what you're told for DCAS. But I would ask the administration to come back another time and let us know why, or this time to come back to us to let us know why you didn't choose to do this same analysis for Health and Hospitals Corporation, SEA, DOE, stuff that you have the data. You, you, you do oversee these agencies to some degree, so I'd like to understand better why you chose 
not to do it, or if you chose to do it, and it's happening at H and H or at DOH and at SCA, but but you are doing it, but not through this process. I think that's the larger question I'd love to hear from the mayor's office. Um, specifically, Kelly, in your testimony, you noted that. MODA anticipates receiving the first set of employee history profile data no later than February 28th. I thought on February 28th everything is due. Uh, because MODA is producing this report every year annually moving forward, um, that is what is meant by the first set of, oh. of data. So by first you mean this year's? This year's, yes. Okay, so it's not that there's a distinction in this year between a first set of data you're getting and then a more refined or different by first you All mean first coming year. To us. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just want to reiterate, I, I'm very interested to know what data was not available, was not produced, maybe because it's voluntary. How much wasn't put forward, um, and which agencies like NYPD, where the data might be sorted using different titles, and the implication of that, sort of what are the ramifications of NYPD collecting the data with these different titles? What are the ramifications of that in terms of what we're looking for. Is that going to be a hurdle for understanding what we're looking for in this data, in this report, to understand pay equity? Or not so much? I think I, I'd like to understand, I'd like to understand before even November or February 28th, what in total, you saw what was missing. So, and, and to be honest, I think we were hoping to get that here, a more granular understanding of the gross data and, and what was coming in and what isn't and why and how you're managing that. I can, I can certainly take that back and uh, we can take a look, but um, as we discussed earlier, our focus through February of 20, February 28th is to ensure that this file is transferred securely to MODA and that they receive the entire file, but I will certainly, right, take, but I will certainly take that back. You're telling me that DCAS is responsible for making the sure the file itself yes. is not just accurate, but if you're you know, using that qualitative lens, comprehending the data that's coming in or not coming in. No? Uh, well, it, following the, um, the scope of the local law, our responsibility was first and foremost to collect this data and to ensure the secure transmission to So is there anyone in the so. administration who's responsible for a qualitative eye? Making, looking at what first comes in. Do you have any other agency? Commission on Gender Equity. Uh, the Mayor's Office of something, something. Working with you to say, let's try to understand the data that's coming in and see if we can't think about asking these questions in a different way to get at the same thing we thought we were going to get. Well, uh, you know, due to the sensitive nature of this information and this data, um, there, you know, uh, we generally do not, we, we don't share that data with other groups. Um, so this is actually unprecedented that we're sharing this large data file. Right. Um, however, um, you know, uh, I believe that the council will be uh, performing an analysis of the data, and uh, from this data set, they'll be able to yeah. garner I, all of I this information. I don't think uh, this sort of, you know, legally and privacy issues, uh, I think you're missing the point of the larger question of the importance of this legislation and the importance of getting it right 
it just feels um, too uh, like um, a lack of enthusiasm for what we're trying to find out about. I mean, the, I, I'm no expert at any of this. I'm just asking you questions based on the common sense knowledge of trying to understand pay equity. And it sounds to me like there's no one in the administration who's giving that qualitative lens to data collection. Look, data collection analytics, just the rote of it, that's your job. I mean, that's based, that's fun, that's like the bar, the lowest, obviously, that's what your job is to do. The harder question, the more interesting question is where are we, where are there hiccups in data collection so that when we do the analysis, we're getting a meaningful result? I'm not hearing anyone is thinking about that. Well, I, I certainly, uh, you know, we certainly would not want um, our limited scope within this local law to indicate our lack of interest or our lack of understanding how um, important and precedent send, setting this bill is. But then if your scope is limited and MOTA's scope is limited, who, who's doing the expansive scope of trying to understand pay equity in the city of New York? Under, you know, under this local law, it would be the um, analytic team from uh, the council who would be performing that analysis. However, on a regular basis, um, the city of New York does take a holistic look at equity um, throughout the city across all of um, the categories of jobs that we have available. Well, for sure, the city council is interested in it. There's no doubt on that. The city council is eager to know about pay equity in the admin in in any admin the executive side of course we're interested and i guess we get a minute to analyze it but i mean okay i'm going to move on to my down to wormhole okay uh thank you for your time i learned a lot it, it, so um i know that council member adams has a question um, but before, uh, I just want to reiterate, for the purposes of this hearing and, and Local Law 18, um, we're looking at compliance, right? First of all, whether or not city agencies have compiled and complied with the data that was asked for. Um, the questions that my colleagues asked was very significant as to whether or not um, they had done that and whether or not some information was omitted or if there was specific information, um, you use the uh, um, analogy of the police department and whether or not that would have an impact and whether or not there was other kind of antiquated or, or, or duplicated titles or information that might have an impact or some other information that were omitted that might have an impact. Certainly, that, that's reasonable questioning, right? But I think um, at what we're not trying to do at this moment is we kind of litigate pay equity, which we spent the last three years, and that we've gotten to the point that in order for us to have fair compensation, which is the goal here, um, and, and pay equity um, amongst these many municipal bargaining units, that there's certain information and data that has to be available according to Taylor Law in order for them to have the, the good faith negotiations that are absolutely necessary, that information has to be provided. And so what we're trying to ascertain today is simply whether or not, in accordance to the rules and regulations and provisions that were put, put forth during um, Local Law 18, are we adhering to that? Is that information available? And, and not kind of just readdress some of the things here, whether or not this information. And I also believe that in the future, those uh, uh, agencies, uh, uh, quasi authorities, uh, the HHCs and the DOEs of the world, they, they certainly have a culpability and a responsibility to adhere to this as well. And so, 
we want to get to that. But for, for the purposes of what we do here today, we need to know that the information that was required is being made available. And then next steps, right? So certainly the council is going to do its job um, to aggregate the information, but, but it, it, the city and everyone else would be remiss if we don't get all this great information and not utilize it to the best of our ability, I think is what my, my, my colleague was expressing here. But with that, I um, want to move forward. Uh, Council Member Adams. Thank you, uh, both chairs today uh, for this hearing. I just need clarity. Uh, we had a lot of um, significant questioning from my colleague from Councilmember Rosenthal. I just need clarity because I don't think that I fully heard or understood uh, as far as adherence to Local Law 18 and the due date of November 30th. We know, I, I got out of your testimony that NYPD is having an issue. Are there any other agencies who are having issues like NYPD? If so, who are they? And when do you expect them to be in compliance? So um, just, I apologize for not being clear. Every city agency is in compliance. They have shared their data with DCAS um, before the November 30th deadline. Um, I was, um, when I was uh, using the example of business title, I was just um, trying to point out that there may be some anomalies in some of the data um, once it's looked at, and that's just from you know a practical understanding of how the businesses are run. Um, but every city agency has met um, the compliance requirement. That's good to know. Thank you. I guess my last question um, is going to be regarding the transfer, regarding the data transfer um, uh, for, for MoDA, are there any concerns about receiving the file at all? Any concerns, anything that you have taken a look at um, to make sure that this file transfer is clean and all things go well? Uh, no concerns on, on our part. Um, this is a part of our regular business within our, our office that we do handle um, a lot of uh, data. Um, and so we are, again, setting up the technical infrastructure to receive the data, but no uh, anticipated challenges. How big a file is this? I think we are looking at a couple megabytes. However, the data is not just one file, so it's a handful of files that are integrated together. So it does make it a, a bit more complex, so it's not just one spreadsheet. How long do you anticipate the file transfer to take, time-wise? Uh, the actual Minute? transfer itself, milliseconds. <laughs> Seconds. <laughs> That's exciting. It is, it is. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So just as a point of clarity, and, and I guess this is, uh, for uh, the Deputy Commissioner, Human Capital. Uh, the total city's workforce is 380,000, somewhere thousand. there. Right. And, and how many, what percentage of, of that 300 plus thousand plus will, will be captured in, in this uh, local law? So that, that I, would have, I would have to get back to you with that number. I don't have that number. And, and how many agencies? Are there any, well, we, we have that, that, that the agencies or others <laughs> that, are, that are omitted from there. Right. Okay. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal, yeah, do you have anything? Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Majority Leader. Absolutely. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up with uh, Council Member uh, M Miller's line of questioning, um, as well as Council Member Rosenthal. They are also very skilled in labor negotiations as well as OMB. I am not as skilled, so my questions will be a little more basic than theirs. Um, just wanted to have like very clear clarity. So. From your testimony, what you're anticipating is that in February, we're gonna be ready to go and the information that was requested from all of the agencies will be in place in order uh, to move forward. Correct. So has the information been reviewed and looked at to make sure that um, agencies aren't just handing in information that's 
half done, a quarter done. And I remember during the negotiations for this, I remember hearing somewhere that even if a, an individual fills out the paperwork, a superior person has the ability to fill out the answers to questions that they may not have answered based off of an assumption. So for example, I'm not sure of what you're requiring and what you're not requiring in this, but let's say someone, the question is that, is someone a man or a female? And they decide not to answer. A superior officer or, or person that works ahead of them could say, I'm checking the box that this person is a man or a woman to the best of my knowledge. Is that part of this process? Uh, well, the, I, I believe that you're referring to certain EEO-related data um, that, yes, um, is required and can be completed by either the agency's EEO officer or HR representative if an employee um, declines to complete it within their initial paperwork. However, um, an employee can always view this information in their employee history profile within um, our NICAPS personnel system, which is, um, we call it employee self-service. So they can go, they can take a look, and they can um, update that as they see fit. Um, so that, uh, so yes, yeah, so that they, and then their, their, um, their data would override what was pre-selected, if it was pre-selected. So with the line of questioning that Councilmember Rosenthal put forward, is it that this information has come in in November, but it hasn't been reviewed to determine the quality of the information that's coming back? So, so yes, yeah, so we're working, uh, we worked with agencies to collect that data by November 30th, and now we are working on the transfer. So of course we're, you know, making sure that the files um, have integrity and that the, you know, the data is as robust as possible, that we're not leaving out data sets or whatnot. But um, yes, that process is still undergoing. So the question that Councilmember Miller asked in regards to the 300,000 plus uh, workforce that we're looking at, um, why would it be thought that some individuals of that number would be counted in this process and some would not? So uh, the number that we had discussed earlier is the number of the entire workforce, including those um, agencies and employees who were excluded from this local law. And actually, um, I just, uh, if I uh, can correct myself, I just received uh, mm -hmm. the total number of employees um, in our t data file, which is 166,568. Um, that number does not include seasonal employees who are covered under this local law. Um, they are not part of the headcount, so that file, you know, that would be in addition to this 166,000. Um, but to, uh, to go back to your, your uh, original question, uh, the, the local law excludes certain agencies and certain employees, such as ped pedagogical employees um, that work at DOE, so the teachers and the principals. So um, whereas they're part of that 390,000 plus headcount, they are not um, part of this local law. Can you break that down for me in terms of, let's just say, for example, why wouldn't they be? Uh, it, it's, it's in the, it's, uh, it, within the local law, they were ex explicitly excluded. Can you give me some more examples of who else was excluded? Pedagogical workers, seasonal workers? Seasonal workers are included. They are included? Yes. Okay, um, who's excluded again? Uh, so excluded um, school construction authority, the, the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, uh, New York City Transit, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, um, and then the local elected uh, officials such as the city council um, district attorneys. How did we get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you would have to ask uh, whoever wrote up this <laughs> local law and, ex and uh, specifically excluded. Um, All right, I will look into that. <laughs> Um, that concludes my questions, thank you. Thank you, I just have a few more questions of understanding just to make sure that, um, I, I just wanna walk through it one more time. Let's pick an agent, a random agency, how about the fire department? The fire department, there's a variety of data you're trying to collect. So how do you go about collecting the variety of data? There's some stuff you must already have, 
right? Right. So that's like gender, race, salary, civil service title. title. Right. Right. And then there are questions that are voluntary. So now it's not in your database. So so do you send out a survey? How do you get the remain the remaining bits of information. So, uh, so what DCAS um, embarked upon was uh, an exercise in requesting from agencies that whether it was the <laughs> HR representative uh, for fields such as the business title or office title or from the employees um, to go into um, our automated personnel system so they can go in and go ahead and enter that data into the personnel system. So when we do the data pull, it's, it's coming you know, from the different, you know, aspects of that system. So the data does, you know, we do have access to that data. So basically you would ask HR or send and or send out a letter to all people who work there and say, please go into your personal file, which you have your account, mm -hmm. and enter information like the latest uh, education level achieved. Right. What were some of the other voluntary questions? Um, I believe, I could just take a look. Uh, so highest level of education, um, number of years of work experience that's outside of the city that an employee may have, um, uh, their, different, uh, their different work experience, out, again, outside of city employment. So basically anything that's specific to you as um, a career um, employee. Uh, you could go ahead and fill in to your profile um, and that way you would have that information there but um, and so we did encourage people because you know not everybody knows that they're able to do that um, so you know we would say hey we have this feature you can go in to your employee self-service profile and fill in all of this up-to-date information about yourself right I mean but it's not a random feature I mean we're doing it because we want to be able to know when we're analyzing the data whether or not level of education plays into a salary inequity, right? Correct. Um, that data is also very important to specific agencies. So agencies want to know what their workforce looks like, and they want to know perhaps um, what the workforce of a particular title looks like. So they are able to um, meet with DCAS to talk about what information is available so that they can have a better understanding of who their workforce actually are. Um, so, so yes, um, you know, it's, it's valuable uh, for, for both of those examples. Right. So let's say we wanted to answer that question at the fire department for the central office, not for firefighters who are union, have union titles, but in the central office, we want to know um, whether or not there's pay equity among uh, all types of diversity. Um, so we want to know, let's say, did a male get promoted many more times than a female, and they both have the same level, history, level of education. Do you feel, what, do you feel like you got enough data from FDNY to be able to do that type of analysis? Um, again, I would have to look, uh, because I'm assuming that if the FDNY uh, uh, came to DCAS and said that they would like to um, look at this data and um, look at how it affects certain um, employees, that they would be specifically looking at one title or maybe a few titles. Um, so uh, again, um, you know, I would need to, and uh, my team would need to take a look just to see how robust uh, whatever piece of information um, is available for FDNY in order to make, um, you know, to have a, a conversation or a discussion regarding. Why wouldn't, so only if the agency, if the fire department wanted to do that analysis, would you, you would do it? I mean, don't you want to do the analysis for the purpose of this report? Uh, and of course, uh, DCAS regularly does do an analysis, but again, since we have this holistic view of the city, we're not, um, you know, unless an agency is specifically requesting that specific title analysis um, or titles analysis, what we do is we take a look at the entire workforce um, across the city 
and uh, look, at, look at that data. And that is uh, published in our workforce profile report which is an annual report um, where we um, do this analysis and we share that with the public. I guess I'm just, uh, okay. Um, do you feel confident that every agency responded in such a way to get to these fundamental questions about pay equity? Uh, we do feel confident um, that we had many discussions, like I said, with agencies, um, either one-on-one -on -one or uh, we have quarterly meetings with personnel representatives from every agency. And we discussed it at length there. Um, you know, and the city has a whole, as a whole does have a commitment to equity. So this exercise um, and this uh, data collection uh, was definitely taken very seriously. I'm going to hone in on the fire department for one second, only because um, I think we've now achieved the goal of 0.1% uh, uh, of firefighters are women. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I want to confirm we, um, and I want to note for the record, our goal is not 0.1%. Um, that do you think for the voluntary data, what percent of that do you think you got for the fire department? Because you're telling me for sure all the mandatory data you have already. Right. So you have gender, you have race, you have years of service, you have band, title bands. Civil service title, yes. Civil service and managerial. Correct. You have all that. Yes. So of the voluntary stuff, do you have a sense whether or not you got more than 50% response rate? I, as I indicated earlier, I do not. Um, but again, I can take that back and we could see um, if we are able to take that look. So specific, just so I'm really clear, I'd like to know by agency of the voluntary data, what was the percentage response rate? So did, did at least, did agencies hit 50%? And, and what I'm hearing from you is that you don't know that information off the top of your head. Do you, do you have a sense of the whole city? What percentage responded to the voluntary data? Right, so um, as you're indicating, the information is voluntary, and yeah. some comes from the agency HR department, but the rest is, um, it comes from our employees. Right. Um, so uh, so uh, to answer your question, no, I don't have um, a sense of specifically for one agency or any agency um, what that response rate was, but what I can um, testify to is that we did reach out and um, oh, sure. inform I'm our sure you workforce. did your job. Yes, um, and encouraged folks to, um, to volunteer this information. Um, of course, yes. I, I'm not questioning that. What I'm trying to understand is if we're gonna understand whether or not the data is valid, one really basic question is what was our response rate? If 1% of staff responded, we know now that the data is not going to be valid. So I'm just asking if you have a sense of, in answering that fundamental question about whether or not the data is valid, so when you send it over, something meaningful can be looked at. Right, so uh, again, our focus was getting that information out, explaining to people why they should fill out this information, and then collecting that information. So doing an analysis of the response rate um, was certainly outside of this exercise, but I'm not saying that we can't uh, go ahead and take a look at that information. But as of today, no. I don't think it's outside of this exercise. I mean, I'm sorry, if you're sending over the data and you don't, don't you want to know what percentage responded? I mean, as part of doing the exercise of getting a 100% response rate, 
and trying to do that extra mile, don't you want to know whether or not you have a 50% response rate or 20% or 2% or 90%? I mean, I want to hear you brag that you, got, that you worked so hard, you got a 90% response rate. Um, so, so yes, again, um, I, I understand what you're saying, um, and I am uh, simply testifying to the voluntary nature of employees. I understand what this, the word voluntary right, means, completing and I understand the complexity of voluntary. That's right. But again, that's your job. That's the nature of. Mm -hmm. So what? I and mean, we all, anyone who's a data analyst knows voluntary is harder than mandatory. putting together the data that you already have in your back pocket. Right. Right? Of course. So you knew that going in. <laughs> we yes. all know that. I'm just questioning whether or not DCAS made an extra effort to get to 100% for voluntary. And the first question to know the answer to that is, what'd you get? Right. Right. I think that we're both trying, we're, I, I, I believe we're both saying the same thing. Um, but I don't. Yes, DCAS. DCAS absolutely did make every effort to encourage folks to um, I don't know this that. information. I don't think you know that. I mean, okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, I just want to make sure uh, two last really quick things. Um, Okay, so you're going to give us, uh, you're going to let us know the response rate, just confirming that. You're going to let us know response rate on the voluntary questions by agency, because hypothetically you have that in your database, and you're just going to, you can go home and go back to your office and click about, I mean, when I do data work, I mean, I know spreadsheet, a lot of data, <clears throat> but you can let us know that within a week. Um, I, I won't specify a time frame, but yes, I will definitely take it back and we will take a look at that. Well, let me make it more to you. reasonable. So you're sending over all the data by February 28th. Correct. Right, Tomoda. Can, can by February 28th you let the city council know the response rate on the voluntary stuff, questions by agency? I understand that's a little bit of a trick question because someone might have filled out only one of three voluntary. <clears throat> so I'm asking you in sum, I'm not going to worry about that when I get, you don't have to fix that. In total, if you were supposed to get 60 responses and you got 20 responses in total, not caring about people, not some people didn't answer, some people answered only one of three. I just want to know that you got 20 out of 60. Understood. Do you think by the 28th we might be able to get that information? Certainly, we will make every effort to do that. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask council staff. That's, I think, my fundamental question, question. that I'm looking for an answer to. Um, okay, so um, I just, sorry, I want to, I'm going to look at one last quick thing and then I'm going to let us move on. Um, and I just want to make sure then, so, so for the mandatory stuff, the stuff that you have in your back pocket at DCAS, you have 100% of that information, right? You already had that. That can go over easily. So the tricky part is the voluntary, right? Uh, I mean, well, stuff about race, gender, length of service, title, you have that. Right, so the, the data file that we have, we have, and so yes, we have all of the information that needs to be transferred, yes. Okay, great, thank you. I think that's it for me, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam uh -huh. Chair, we're gonna hear from Majority Leader Combo now. Thank you, Councilmember Miller and Rosenthal for your questions. So that brought up something different for me in this way. So when you say that all of the agencies have submitted their information that means that of each agency one or two percent could have filled out the information and turned it in and then checked the box we've turned in the information 
Uh, again, we didn't um, ask I guess yes or no on yes. that? Yes. Yes. So in February, when the information has to be transferred over, you all could just be submitting, hypothetically, one to two percent of response rates from each agency, and that's what people will have to review and look at? For certain data points, um, uh, as uh, Chair Rosenthal indicated, uh, we have certain data points for every city employee, such as civil service um, title, uh, city entry date, so how many years they've worked for the city. So we have that information for every single person that needs to be, every um, employee that we would report out. So some information. That's correct. Will be transmitted as a result of what you already know. And then some information with additional data points will be submitted voluntarily. And that will be corroborated with what you know and what they know. What you know and what they submitted will be considered an entry? For each employee, yes. So um, if an employee, um, every field was applicable to them and every employee um, responded to the voluntary questions, then yes, you would have a 100% uh, response rate for that particular person. However, um, if an employee uh, selected to complete 50% of the voluntary information, that file is still being um, transferred over. So all of the information that DCAS has, which is all of the information that um, is available to us, will be transferred over for every employee. So the very technical question that Councilmember Rosenthal was asking that I want to gain clarity on is, she was saying, and paraphrase me and correct me, you're saying that your question to them is, do you know at what point, what percentage of your folks have filled out the information at this point? Oh, yeah. And they don't know that. Not here. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for your testimony. Um, we have another panel, two more panels to hear from. So we want to thank you for the information. And obviously, um, the committee is going to uh, be requiring, requesting additional information. Hopefully, we'll have that uh, in the, in a reasonable amount of time. The amount of time that is requested by my colleague. Um, sorry, just. One quick last question. I just want to confirm, I think you made it clear, but I just want to confirm for the record. Um, do you have any concerns about privacy or security in the data transfer? Yes. So when it comes to the actual underlying um, raw data elements that are being sent over, we don't have concerns around the technical nature of the transfer. Um, but when it comes to the raw individual level, there are 22 data elements as per the local law. Um, the, the governance around that and the uh, way in which we manage the data being moved from DCAS to MODA um, those, those are concerns that we share broadly across any types of analytics projects that may relate to uh, individual level data. What security measures do you, have you put in place? I mean, surely this stuff is done all the time. Nothing is impenetrable. But what security measures have you put in place? So there's a, a, few, um, a few processes that we are working through right now. There's a few different mechanisms for doing the actual transfer. One is to make sure that the data, while it's at DCAS, is actually encrypted and that it's encrypted on its way to MODA. And then when it is actually in storage um, at MODA for analysis, only the individuals who have access to the data are permitted to have access to the data. And then in addition to that, um, that we are managing the governance long term because this will be data that we have access to um, moving forward. Do you need in data encryption is pretty basic. That's uh, I'm not a technical person, but everyone uses those words. Is there, do you need funding for an additional level of security that would make you feel confident that it, it's even more secure? 
We have the resources that we need using citywide uh, technology and, and security protocols that are in place um, for moving uh, individual level data from one location to another. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to just close by saying, with the exception of Council Member Miller, who we love very much, it's all women behind this table, all women behind that table, and all women who are here in this audience that have brought this particular legislation forward. Let's get this right, because it is too important, and there are too many cities and states that are looking for us to get this right so that they can model it all across the country. So this is really important legislation that we can't afford to let I don't know, all of this minutia that we're talking about get in the way of getting this information and correcting a generational wrong, a centuries of wrongs. So I just want to express this. This is really our moment in history as women in history um, for us to get this right because too many women are living in conditions and in circumstances and situations that are not allowing them to live their full life and to be the productive members of the city of New York, and we have to be the role models and the inspiration for cities across the country. Thank you. That is well said, and, and, and everybody in this room has been a part of this journey for, for far too long, right? And, and so we will get it right for sure. And everyone here remains committed, most importantly. And, 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 and we certainly take that even from the agencies that are, that are here as well. And, and before, and I'm absolutely gonna let you go. What role, if any, is, is do it playing in the transfer of the data? Sorry. What uh, role, if any, is do it playing in the transfer of the data? Uh, Moda is working with do it uh, and has been uh, to actually stand up the technical infrastructure. So they provide IT services to us. Um, as they do with other city agencies across the board. So they are serving as advisors um, working with us here. So we're comfortable that all agencies that may have some form of oversight and expertise in, in not just gathering of the data, but the transfer of the data are involved in this process, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and we're gonna hold you to that. With that, we're gonna call our next panel. Once again, thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you. Daryl Chalmers from Local 2507. Dr. Joseph Wilson. Michael Reardon. And my good friend, Oren Paranzi. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. That comes with the uh, little council thing. It's very cool. Yeah. And yes, this whole it's thing durable is your too. cool thing. It's durable too. Okay. Um, right. Where's Brandon? Come on. We are a kick-ass team. Kick-ass. Kick like that phone. Love working with you. I know. Mm. I brag. Okay, gentlemen, you can begin. Uh, please identify yourselves and before making your statements.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chairperson Miller and Chairperson Rosenthal. Thank you very much for today. FDNY uniform fire protection inspectors are 85% minority men and women, members who are peace officers as are New York City firefighters. The New York City Fire Department's Bureau of Fire Prevention is a life safety and revenue producing bureau generating approximately $85 million annually to the department and to the city. The Bureau of Fire Prevention members consist of 414 fire protection inspectors and inspectional units which check the compliance of all fire and building code regulations, including the building we're in right now. Um, related to fire safety, fire protection inspectors are tasked to inspect and witness the testing of safety equipment in buildings for firefighting operations such as standpipe systems, sprinkler systems, etc., at various locations throughout the New York City, including our bridges, tunnels, piers, rooftops, ladders, subways, construction sites, restaurants, basements, commercial and residential high-rise buildings. Fire protection inspectors make sure that the systems used for firefighting operations on premises are in working order, plus protecting the lives and property of city residents, employees, and visitors. The effort of the fire protection inspectors over the past several years has resulted in sufficient reduction of fire deaths related to fires at a record low in the history of the fire department. And the famous 4th of July fireworks display under the explosive unit, which your fire protection inspectors are the ones on the barge in the water every time you see that show every year, we're the ones in charge. Uh, make sure that the public and the city is safe for you guys to enjoy that show every year. And that's any fireworks display in the city of New York is done by us. We're the ones who actually supervise that. And for your fourth of, uh, and for New Year's celebration, we're the ones in charge of that at the top of the ball. We're the ones on the roof, your fire protection inspectors, to make sure it's safe so you can enjoy the show. And I will leave that for Mike Reardon, who's my colleague, who also is the deputy chief inspector. I will let him speak. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, panel. Thank you for this opportunity to come here and speak with you today. Uh, the Boat Fuel Safety Unit. This unit conducts inspections and checks code compliance of the installations of underground and above ground storage tanks, associated piping systems containing flammable and volatile motor fuels. Review of plans on site for such installations, including the installation and testing of fire suppression system at service stations and private filling stations. We conduct inspections, plan review, and testing of the following facilities, bulk fuel facilities, national grid, liquid natural gas, compressed natural gas, Con Edison power plants, methane recovery plants, and cogen facilities. We witnessed the testing of the foam fire protection systems, loading rack sprinkler systems, conduct inspections, plan review, and testing of the new pipelines, cut out replacement of pipelines, conduct annual pipeline uh, drills and division and fire units. Conduct inspections of three pipeline companies which supply gas fuel, gasoline, and fuel oil to JFK Airport and LaGuardia Airports, as well as patrolling these pipelines monthly. Conduct inspections of three pipeline companies, control centers in New Jersey. Conduct a leak detection system test, Bryansville, Pennsylvania, on the Buckeye Pipeline. Respond to pipeline leak, emergencies, power plants, CNG, LNG, methane recovery, and Con Ed National Grid gasoline service stations, and private filling stations. Thank you. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, Chairs Miller and Rosenthal and distinguished council members. My name is Dr. Joseph Wilson. I'm representing the FDNY Fire Prevention Inspectors, Local 2507. Uh, by background, I'm a specialist and an author in uh, labor and civil rights and African-American workers. My um, academic training is at uh, Columbia and Harvard, and I established the nation's uh, first diversity center uh, at CUNY. The uh, title of my very brief presentation, and it won't be professorial, is uh, FDNY Fire Prevention Inspectors, Unsung Heroes, saving lives, keeping the public safe. 
My comments today on behalf of the fire prevention inspectors are intended to call public attention to the life-saving, often dangerous work of the FPIs in relation to the denial of promotional opportunities in the FDNY. The dramatic decrease in fires and fire-related injuries and fatalities in New York City over the last 10 years in large measure is due to the valiant, indeed often heroic, work of the fire protection inspectors. However, the inspectors' work doesn't often make the limelight. Therefore, we must bring public awareness to their conditions of employment. They save us not only from fires in our homes, schools, offices, shopping centers. They save us from gas explosions, oil pipeline and jet fuel fires and explosions, preventing the release of toxic gases and hazardous materials. They prevent deaths and injuries from fireworks accidents, as Brother Chalmers just mentioned, at displays like the Macy's 4th of July celebration and New Year's Eve in Times Square. They climb dangerous water towers for inspection high above the tallest buildings. Fire prevention inspectors witness the testing of all fire suppression systems throughout the five boroughs. They work in advance of firefighter operations so that the firefighters, as first responders, are able to get water as soon as they arrive at the scene of a fire. In addition to lives saved and countless injuries averted, FPIs save the city billions of dollars in revenue by preventing property loss from fires, construction, accidents, and mass casualties at public events. The fire prevention inspector's cause and case I present today is an economic justice argument. We present this also as a moral and ethical argument in the name of racial equality. Not least importantly, this is a cautionary note because if the inequities faced by the FPIs aren't addressed by our elected leaders, then costly legal battles are looming and unavoidable. The FDNY has three primary non-supervisory jobs, firefighter, EMS, and fire prevention inspector. In 2017, the median salary of firefighters was over $85,000. With overtime, median compensation for firefighters was over $100,000. In 2017, about 75% of the firefighters were Caucasian, about 25% racial minorities. In 2017, the median salary of EMS employees, EMTs, and paramedics was about 50,000. In 2017, about half of the EMS employees were Caucasian, and about half were racial minorities. EMS employees mirror the city's diversity. In 2017, the median salary of fire protection inspectors and associate fire protection inspectors was also about 50,000. In 2017, only about 25% of the FPIs were Caucasian. The other 75% were racial minorities. This is an overwhelmingly minority profession. The duties of both EMS employees and FPIs overlap with firefighters. Like firefighters, EMS and fire prevention inspection employees are first responders, often in crisis situations. Firefighters spend much of their time inspecting buildings for fire code violations, just as FPIs do. The duties of FPIs overlap in many ways with firefighter duties. EMS employees deservedly have the right to take the promotion to firefighter exam. If they pass, they will be considered for firefighting before the general open competitive list. They then will be able to earn tens of thousands of dollars more per year than their fellow unionists who are fire prevention inspectors. Unfairly, there is no similar avenue for FPIs to be promoted to firefighter. The promotion to firefighter exam 
inexplicably isn't available to the FPIs who are equally deserving of the opportunity to become firefighters. This is unfair to fire prevention inspectors. It should be fixed henceforth just as a matter of fairness. In addition, because a much higher percentage of fire prevention inspectors are racial minorities, this provision of not allowing FPIs to take the promotion to firefighter exam deprives the FDNY of a rich, experienced, talented pool of people of color, a talented employment pool of people of color. This irrational barrier also has an adverse and disparate impact harmful to FPIs who are predominantly racial minorities. Not fixing this disparity creates the obvious, obvious risk of significant legal liability for the city. For both ethical and legal reasons, this disparity should be quickly fixed, I might add. We call upon the Civil Service Committee and related city council committees to push for an immediate and urgent resolution of this gross injustice in time for the next promotion to firefighter exam occurring sometime in 2020. The, this exact date has not been set yet. Could you wrap it up, please? Yep. We're staunch advocates in support of EMS employees having their promotional opportunities. It should be absolutely continued. What we are saying is that the same avenue for promotional opportunity should be extended to FBIs as well. Thank you for this opportunity to address you. We look forward to enlist your support as we fight for the dignity and justice for our fire prevention inspectors. Thank you. Is it okay if I uh, testify with the next panel? If you have any, if you have any questions for them, is it okay if I wait for the next pa panel to testify? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, we do. Uh, you said your 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 most recent head count is four hundred eighty something somewhere in there. Four fourteen. Uh, what's the attrition rate over there? We're getting a large pool of young candidates because to become a fire protection inspector, you have to have a two-year college degree, or you can have a background in suppression systems, or you can be a prior volunteer firefighter, then you also qualify for the job. So now we're starting to get a good young pool of people coming in for the job, men and women, and, and they love the job because they learn a lot. So. Um, that's what we're getting right now. So the opportunity for the promotion of firefighter, as the professor was just talking to you about, we, we don't have it. And the reason why this was brought up is because a lot of lieutenants and captains who are on the job, who used to be fire protection inspectors, had to take the open competitive. And they think it's unfair because they said the duties that they learned as fire prevention inspectors helped them more as being a firefighter and a lieutenant and a captain because they have a clear understanding of firematics. So, yeah, that, that's <laughs> kind of answered both of my questions on, on um, the qualifications of, mm -hmm. of the job. Were, were there technical qualifications, trades um, qualifications aside from, uh, could you have a, maybe an associate's or two-year trades degree as well, uh, certificate and that would qualify you? And then what's the average age? Do you know that? Well, the average age of, of an inspector coming on the job on. in the past used to be guys would come in at, at their age of like 40, 50, because there's no age limit for the job. So now we're getting a pool of young candidates who have a two-year degree, so we're getting people at the age of 23, 24. Um, I have a big pool of uh, candidates coming in at that age. So that's the reason why a lot of them were asking. Right. For the promotion of firefighters, because too. historically folks would be aged out. That's correct. And and now, be, be, because of the new pool and, and demographics of that pool, that is correct. It, it becomes necessary. Okay. And also, councilman, I just want to make a note that also with that, you have the opportunity for you to become a lieutenant in the New York City Fire Department. You have to have a college degree. 
So already you have a group of minorities who are coming on the job who already have the degree already, which now they can take this promotional test to lieutenant or captain. Do you understand? So they already have that credential instead of being a firefighter who would have to go to college to have to get his degree. So now you're getting a group of men and women who are minorities who already have a college degree that can automatically take the next promotional test to lieutenant and captain as long as we have the promotion to firefighter. Okay. Added as with my brothers and sisters from EMS. Okay, thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. your testimony. Mm -hmm. That will call the next panel. Yep, that's good. Orin, you can remain. And we have Vincent Bayal, Delvane Powell, and Michael Greco. Did, did everyone uh, submit testimony or do everyone have testimony to be submitted? You may begin from either end or the end. Dear Chairman Miller and committee members, thank you for the chance to speak. My name is Dalvin K. Powell, and I'm the president of the United Probation Officers Association. I represent over 1,200 probation officers and supervising probation officers, including retirees. My members consist of 90% people of color and 78% of which are women. We are honored to have been invited to participate and testify today on the importance of pay equity in the city, city's workforce. The lack of pay equity is a reality for my members' lives every day. It impacts the pay, it, it impacts the pay we, we receive, but it starts with the way we are perceived. Attitudes and assumptions create a vicious cycle that perpetuates stereotypes and allows differential treatment to go unnoticed and uncorrected. When people think of the criminal justice system, they tend to think of the courts, police, corrections, and parole. Probation is a piece of the anatomy of the criminal justice system that is often forgotten or grossly confused for other law enforcement agencies. The work we do, the level of danger, the challenges, and the training we are required to complete is greatly unseen and misunderstood. The task of a probation officer is unique and highly demanding as we are charged with enforcing court orders, helping individuals rehabilitate in lieu of incarceration, and performing duties of, as, a, as a peace officer. We have an intel unit of probation officers who execute warrants within New York and as well as other states. There's also a cyber unit. These officers work detailed with the NYPD, Department of Corrections, U.S. Marshals, Homeland Security, and many other law enforcement agencies. Field visits are made in, in some of the most dangerous neighborhoods. Probation officers are at just as much risk as any other law enforcement officers. This year, to my knowledge, probation officers have been physically attacked, verbally abused, attacked by pit bulls, pit bulls, suffered bodily injuries, including concussions from falls, stalked and exposed to dangerous environmental hazards. Probation officers are required to work various shifts, including nights, weekends, and holidays. While our work is shown to reduce recidivism and increase success, we are not recognized. To be qualified for a career as a probation officer, one must have a graduate degree from an accredited college or at least a bachelor's degree from a credit college or a university and two years of satisfactory full experience in a job-related field, complete two months of training and satisfy training requirements to become New York State peace officers. Yet the current hiring rate of, a probation, of probation officers will be now at 42,759 under our new contract in accordance with recent notice of examination for the promotion position to the current minimum salary for a supervisor probation officer is only $54,030. These rates of pay for a small family in New York City falls under the poverty line and the line other predominantly of color city workforces such as EMS. We cannot retain members because of the poor salary, high demands, and lack of recognition. As this body knows, in order to achieve the goal of pay equity, we must first admit that there is a problem. But we cannot stop there. We must also have the intentions to make the commitment to change the attitudes that allows this to persist. I want to thank this body for taking leadership on ending the cycle of poverty that the city employees face, employees face due to discriminatory pay 
practices and pay inequity by passing Local Law 18. This is a huge step towards getting the information necessary to acknowledge that there is a problem by requiring the city to look at the data. My fear is that, the, that, is that DCAS will not take the necessary step of acknowledging and changing the underlying problems. As you know, data can be ignored or swept away. And we must make sure that the city commits to doing the difficult work of making changes instead of digging into a position of defensiveness and denial. DCAS continues to stonewall efforts by our union and others to get paid data necessary for our unions to, to address these problems. Notwithstanding Local Law 18, DCAS consistently ignores FOIA requests and refuses to turn over public records with protectual claims of privacy concerns. My members are not concerned that people will know, that they know their gender or their race. They are concerned that they will not be able to put food on their family's tables. They are tired of being treated without dignity they deserve on the job, and they are tired of risking their lives only to be unseen and unrecognized. This administration, is not, this, did, this administration did not start this problem, but they are responsible for ending it. We are not blaming anyone when we say that we must and in this, in this cycle, and again, I want to thank this body for this vital work in helping our members and, and correcting this injustice over, long overdue for this city. <coughs> Excuse me. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Miller and distinguished members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. My name is Vincent Variali, and I am president of the Uniformed EMS Officers Union Local 3621. I am also speaking on behalf of Joseph Pataki, the president of the EMS Superior Officers Association, who, who could not be here today in person, but want to express his gratitude and show support for this body's important work on the issue of achieving pay equity within New York City's workforce. The city of New York is the employer for over 350,000 individuals within 50 agencies, including the fire department where our members work. Since merging with the fire department in 1996, EMS has felt the institutional challenges the department has grappled with, with regards to bias. This impacts all aspects of its operations, from the work culture, hiring, promotions, pay, and resource allocation within the department. EMT base salaries start around $35,000 a year and cap around $50,000 a year after five years. Paramedics who have even more medical training, including a New York State paramedic certification and regional medical certifications, start at only $45,000 a year. Similarity, similar, similarly, lieutenants and captains' top pay is capped at $71,000 and $75,000, respectively. Comparatively, other first responders, such as those on the fire side of the same department, earn $110,000 after five years on the job. Police officers are similarly compensated, as are sanitation workers. The common difference these other titles share in that they are much more white and much more male. This stark difference in pay and its corresponding demographic relationship in our department exemplifies what is a citywide problem of pay inequity. While the example we offer in the FDNY shows an extreme contrast in pay and demographics, in fact, when you step back and look at the demographics, pay and work obligations within other agencies and departments throughout New York City, you can see a pattern of segregation emerge in which white and male employees are given more desirable positions, paid more, offered more employment opportunity and advancement, better recognition and authority, while employees of color and women are saddled with greater responsibilities, offered less career advancement, required to cover changes in the work requirements while receiving less recognition and less pay for their services and sacrifices. You can see this with the example of the UPOA gives in law enforcement, and you can see across all city agencies in the landmark litigation with CWA Local 1180, where administrative managers were given significant responsibilities, such as standing in for heads of department and jobs like deputy director, but still thought of and referred to as paid secretarial. This problem did not start with this administration, but until it is ended, it will perpetuate cycles of poverty in the city. Anytime you have a workforce as massive as New York City's without a comprehensive plan in place to prospectively address bias, you will inevitably end up with the problem New York City currently struggles with of pay inequity. 
However, now that we know that this is a problem and it does exist, the city has an affirmative legal and moral obligation to address and resolve this problem. Local Law 18 is a good step in this process, and we thank this body for making this law a reality. But turning over data is the first step, and unfortunately, data alone will not solve the problem. We must see a willingness from the city to act as a partner, to acknowledge the problem and commitment to spend the resources necessary to remedy the problem. Saying that this will cost money to fix is not an excuse to perpetuate segregation, discrimination, and relegate civil servants and their families to a life of poverty. This city has the resources to make these changes and the long-term effect to pay equity will actually save money and improve the quality of life of the city and its employees. We look forward to working in partnership with this committee and this council to bring New York City as an employer into the 21st century and to build on the work this body has already done to finally and fully end pay inequity in New York City's workforce. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and distinguished members of the Civil Service Labor Committee. My name is Owen Barzale the president of FDNY EMS Uniform EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors of Local 2507. Thank you for allowing me the chance to address you today with regards to the importance of pay equity for our members. Pay equity is not just a lofty goal that the city should aspire to, it is a fundamental right, the absence of which causes great adversity and hardship significantly diminishing the equality of life of those who are subjected to desperate and unfair pay practices. The FDNY has two bureaus. One is almost exclusively white and male, and one is predominantly of color with the largest number of women of any first responders in the city. Both sides provide life-saving emergency services. You can guess which side is paid more given more resources, respect, and recognition. But what is shocking is just how much this disparate treatment impacts our members who report that. Despite working highly demanding full-time job as first responders, risking their lives and often completing overtime, many have to apply for food stamps, sleep in homeless shelters, and leave hand, by, hand to mouth wondering if they, if they will have enough to survive. Equally shocking is the city denial of the cycle of poverty and hardship created by these pay practices, or the fact that these problems disproportionately affect the female and non-white city employees. Despite numerous lawsuits, large rallies, reports by the public advocate, and even the New York Times weighing in and calling for pay equality for EMS members, the city refuses to acknowledge there is even a problem to remedy. How do we solve this problem when the city refuses to be our partner? On behalf of Local 2507 and our members, I want to thank the council for passing Local 018, which requires the city to disclose pay data and to use this information to remedy its discriminatory pay practices. By getting this aggregated data, the city has an opportunity to remedy problems that exist and to change the quality of life for city employees. But of course, this requires a willingness to acknowledge the problem and a desire to be part of the solution once you have that data. This administration has the opportunity to be on the right side of this issue. History will judge. And I am sure this body will preserve the remain vigilant, ensure that the city will not engage in the same bad faith delay tactics that we have met with our effort to get similar data. In May of 2017, over two and a half years ago, we asked the city to provide our union with pay data so that we could better understand the disparate pay issues our members face to help them. The city refused, requiring us to bring in Article 78. We offered a solution to every questionable excuse the city gave 
not to turn this data over. We offered to have the data redacted. We offered to have our statistician do the work to prepare the data. We offered to have the files pulled in an alternative way, rather than work with us to get this information and correct these problems, the city has become reluctant and defensive and has, and has used its resources to deny the problem. A commitment to non-discrimination in the workforce is a commitment to excellence. The ability of the FDNY to provide the highest level of emergency preparedness to the largest, busiest EMS systems require that those providing the service be paid a living wage. The cost of ignoring this problem is significantly more expensive and more dangerous than the cost of ending pay inequality. As reflected stories in New York, in New Yorkers read and hear about daily, EMS employees save countless lives. Our members save taxpayers billions of dollars annually based on industry standards. In reality, human life is priceless and so is the life-saving work of our valiant EMS, paramedics, and fire inspectors. We are seeking a simple wage equity and salaries that reflect our life-saving work, our everyday contribution to the quality of life of all New Yorkers. The mayor has justified under underpaying EMS workers because he says the work is different. Actually, EMS workers are different. They are more diverse highly skilled, first responders who rescue all citizens in medically urgent situations, including rescuing police officers, firefighters, accident victims, children, and the most vulnerable. We even save elected officials who face medical trauma. EMS workers risk life and limb every day taking care of all New Yorkers. They respond to over 1.6 million emergency calls annually. They are exposed to disease, dangers, and frequently violent conditions. They sometimes shed their own blood in the line of duty. They operate horrend in horrendous traumatic situations as first responders. The mayor was elected using the, the allegory of Charles Dickens, a tale of two cities, rich and poor, black and white, unequal and unjust. Yet our mayor, like another Dickens character, a Christmas tale, the Scrooge refuses to acknowledge EMTs, paramedics' life-saving work on behalf of all New Yorkers. This mayoral administration has only a Scrooge-like lump of coal as a reward for the valiant EMS workers and our fire inspectors. Insultingly, at last September's Civil Service Committee hearing, the fire department brass actually, as a group, stood up and walked out of this committee's hearing insultingly without even listening to the stories of valor and sacrifices of our EMS workers. Perhaps the mayor doesn't get it. Perhaps the mayor doesn't understand that the FDNY is adding insult to injury. In his name, by turning the administration's back literally and figuratively on EMS employees in this committee hearing and at the collective bargaining table. But we want to make sure that our elected officials understand that we are held accountable and will fight politically to make our interests known and responded to. Whenever there is an injury, a family or loved one, regardless of the dangers, EMS is on the scene in minutes, even in the most dangerous of conditions. God forbid in a medical crisis, even the mayor must rely on EMS employees from dispatch to ambulance crews. We call upon the mayor during this holiday season to stop being a hey, Scrooge, it's time for the mayor and FDNY to recognize and compensate the value of, and heroism of our EMS workers. The mayor can draw upon Christmas Carol and replace the lump of coal he puts on the table in collective bargaining for EMS with a gift of justice and equality that our members have earned, that they deserve, and that all New Yorkers would respect. When it comes to subsidies and tax breaks for developers, somehow the city magically finds billions of dollars to give to the 1% who are most fortunate and most powerful among us. But when it comes to working people, the city has its leadership pleads poverty, 
indifference, and all too often exhibits disdain regarding the working conditions and pay equity. We call upon the mayor to have a change of heart and to reject the city's Scrooge-like bargaining stance with our union. And in the name of justice, help our members bridge the pay equity gap so EMS employees can earn a wage that reflects the life-saving value our members who contribute to the city on a daily basis. Thank you for the opportunity to present our members' concerns, and more importantly, thank for your solidarity in support of our EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Thank you, Chairperson Miller, uh, and thank you, Council members, for your tireless efforts in pay equality. Um, my name is Michael Greco. I'm the Vice President of Local 2507. I did not prepare a testimony. Um, I do have one written now in response to basically what DCAS said when they came up here, so I will make it available in email form for the record. Um, I just wanted to comment on DCAS stating over and over how sensitive the information uh, required on the local law 18 is and how carefully they need to protect it, thus causing delays. Of course, we want to protect data. Our members deal with HIPAA issues and concerns all the time, and we understand sensitive information. The only sensitive information in local law is salary and pay. That's the sensitive part. The other voluntary, the gender, the, the whether your race, that is voluntary information that isn't as sensitive nature. However, it's already affirmatively required to be made public before Local Law 18 was ever enacted. I can go to a website and get it, my pay, my salary, and everything. This is all a pretext because the city doesn't want to have race and gender data. It's that simple. We have been suing them for two years for race and data, and like my colleagues have said, they just refuse and put stumbling blocks in front of us at every time. Data is only good as those analyzing the results. Pay equality isn't just an issue that affects wherever the mayor identifies there is one. When he feels the cause is right, he moves mountains. But when confronted with issues right under his nose, he not only draws a line in the stand, but then sticks his head right in it. Less than 1% female of firefighters, I'm sorry, less than 1% of firefighters are female. We have 30%. If you just look at that number, you would think that's a fantastic number. However, because one area is so underrepresented, should we be content at 30%? Millions are spent to get over the 1% mark, yet not a dime is spent to get us over 30. We've been at that number for quite some time. We should not be happy with the status quo simply because other people are so bad at it. We have 50% women in this world, 50% men, we're close. We should be striving and spending the money to recruit even higher. Let's not rest on our laurels simply because we're at a number as 30%. The fact that 3,000 members of a 4,100 member force of EMTs and paramedics have less than five years shows how underpaid and undervalued we are. Now forgive me, I know those last stats aren't about the local law, but I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't just give you one. Other than that, I am available for questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, for your testimony. Um, I do have a, a few questions. First of all, I, I, let me just say I was kind of going over the years in and, I was, and, and uh, some of the work that the committee has done, and I was looking at the amazing uh, rally that we had on the steps um, in October? September. September, September. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing rally um, that brought attention to the world, the plight of the EMS EMT, and, and quite frankly, who the FDMY continues to be. Um, we have additional legislation that we think we'll be addressing some of that stuff, but for the purposes of what we, we're doing here today, um, I first want to ask simply, um, from a collective bargaining standpoint, does the information that is required that has been uh, kind of aggregated and, and agreed upon 
for local law um, is that sufficient not that's just sufficient for for the purposes of of these bargaining units uh in terms of pay equity having that information is that some of the data that was missing the information that was missing during past negotiations things that um obviously you had to sue to get information will some of this information be uh available to you by virtue of local law is there something that or is there additional information that would be required um, in order to have the type of good faith negotiations that are necessary for the membership to have proper compensation? I just want to address that. The information is relatively good. Um, I just have to say the problem isn't the information. The problem is collective bargaining. Um, when you turn around and do pattern bargaining, if you were being racist to us by paying us less than other people at the last contract, if you're offering 7.5% over 44 months like you are everybody else, you're just increasing that problem. Because if you make $100,000 and you give that person a 10% raise, you've just rewarded them with a $10,000 raise. If I'm significantly paid less at 50000 and you offer me a 10% raise, you've just paid me $5,000 raise. So if we're saying that the pay quality is so prevalent and then you offer me a pattern bargaining, you're basically spitting in our face and saying there's not a problem, we're going to offer you just as much as everybody else while not offering as much as everybody else. So the numbers, while some race, some gender, some uh, pay versus others is great and it's, it's good numbers. But if I bring it to the table and they don't want to look at it, it's, it's a problem. So, so clearly there's a number of dynamics that have, there's a number of lawsuits that, that they've been engaged in over the years. Um, a number have been settled. Um, negotiations is, is about leverage, right? Does this information assist you and beyond that? Because when the, when the admin, and when we talk about, when I talk about pay equity, proper compensation, I know that the solution, the answer does not come in and come through collective bargaining, right? Because we are all bound by the Taylor law here, right? And as you indicated, somebody gets seven and a half percent, you get seven and a half percent, and you remain at the same level, and, and you're just like that hamster, never catching up, right? What is it that... But the data will show that there is a disparity. It will right. confirm, actually, I want to correct, I just want to say, it will confirm the disparity that we already know exists. And the importance of that information will, I think, will help us with collective bargaining, with, with litigation currently, to, to uh, help the mayor see the wrong errors of his ways that uh, um, we're being discriminated against. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I think that information would be helpful overall. Long term, collective bargaining wise, it could be helpful. Um, but certainly right now, they've been putting nothing but obstacles in our way from pre and preventing us from trying to get that information. As Vice President Greco stated, two years now we had a lawsuit going for this information, and for two years they put up ridiculous arguments between veteran, questioning whether Veterans Day is a holiday to, to sensitive information that can be found on the website if you go online. And um, these are all just play that they use to... to uh, prevent us from getting the information that's needed. We've seen it time and time again from different bargaining units that have come before this body to address it. And, 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 and what was kind of the reasoning behind it was that it was universal information that was relevant to collective bargaining, specific to pay equity, mm -hmm. right? And obviously, there's information that is necessary for collective bargaining, but specifically, to those bargaining units that, that are attempting to address pay equities, whether or not this information is relevant to this, is there other requisite information? It, the, the bottom line with this information is we keep on bringing out the data and keep saying where our numbers are, that we know it's true. Right. But without the mayor's office or, or the DCAS presenting that data, they're gonna keep dismissing our argument as that's union rhetoric because they're not showing the proof 
They're not showing to confirm numbers that we know exist. So they could still hold on to that shred of argument they have left to say that. But once they put that information out there, they no longer have that argument. They can't say that anymore because it's right in front of everybody's face. So then it could help us long term make the argument that you are clearly, and it's not just me saying it so, is clearly uh, uh, discrimination because we are get, not getting paid, uh, the same, we're not getting the same equity as other uh, uh, responding, ag other agencies, first responders and, and emergency services and so forth. Okay, and, and you know that part of it is that the council itself has 90 days to aggregate the information as well. So obviously, um, by virtue of the hearings that we've held over the last few years uh, and dealing with specific bargaining units, we know what to look for, right? And, and, we appreciate and so that. we're going to spend 90 days kind of taking a look at that. And whatever story that is told from the other side of the building, we're going to tell the story. And certainly um, from this seat, um, I, I obviously, we, I think we know what to look for. Right. When Councilwoman Rosenthal was asking the city if they can produce data on specific agencies, they deliberately avoided that because they don't want to produce it. They want to do a globalized number because once you pinpoint agencies, then it will show the discrepancies and the inequality. That's where the numbers will show and they don't want to produce that. If they were to do what you asked them to do, it will show exactly what it is that you're looking for and why the numbers would prove that there is a disparity and equality. So again, for the purposes of this hearing, I think that we've already defined what the ask are, uh, what we think is the requisite information that is relevant to help uh, to ensure that we don't have the type of pay disparities that we've seen, that I've seen over my 30 years as a civil servant, uh, as a president, as a business agent, as a, you know, a, an employee. Um, on all sides, we know that there, there are discrepancies that are, that are quite intentional, right? And that they're more pre prevalent in some agencies more so than others. And um, I, I think that this information, look, we, we've spent the greater part of the last three years bringing this to the forefront, as you said, has been, has been magnified and identified and written about um, time and time again. But from your perspective, it's just time to, to see something done about it, right? right? And, and sitting there, um, and, and I'm gonna be very public about this, the council has done a lot of things around that, in my opinion, um, that is the responsibility of those who are responsible for collective bargaining, which is organized labor and the leadership that is there, that we can provide you with the tools and the resources, but what we cannot do is bargaining on your behalf, so I'm gonna stop short of that. Don't <laughs> ask us to do that. Um, and to ask has come time and time again, but don't ask me to do it, because otherwise I'm putting you out of business. And I don't know what you know about the people that you represent, the industries that you represent, and, and, and the benefit and the services that they provide. I think anything that I could do, that this body can do, would be certainly the floor, and, and, and not the ceiling which your membership deserves. So I, I think that working together, uh, and, and, and what I would ask is, if there's any uh, additional information or anything that uh, you believe that was omitted, that you please let us know. It doesn't have to be at this moment, um, but get it to us so that we can, we can and, uh, uh, you know, make amendments or requests of, of DCAS in, in doing so, and or that we can consider this information as we aggregate in the data that is given to us or the lack thereof. And as far as that law is concerned, I think in the next 90 days we'll show you're going to get a massive data dump. You're going to get a lot of information coming in. And the next 90 days is going to show what we might have to adjust to it, as in how to interpret the data. Um, and we, we might not know what questions to ask right now, because after a bunch of people look at it, we might all be interpreting it a certain way. And we're going to have to come up with a uniform way of interpreting. And then now, what are the results and plan of action with that data. If you notice that two secretarial agencies arbitrarily, you know, are making $20,000 different, having that information is great. 
but what are the steps in the law to remedy the situation? Right. That, I think, is going to be the most important part in the next 90 days and the next year of this law to figure out. If we show the mayor, look, there's a 20%, 30% in all these areas, but he doesn't want to do anything about it, we might have to put more teeth into it to, to adjust. So I think that's where the next 90 days will be beneficial for us. I really appreciate everyone's testimony. So thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you for your patience. Um, there was one person who read extensive testimony, I think beyond what we received a copy of. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll submit the copy. So, you, so it was very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send it. I have one, something else I want to add. I know it has, it doesn't really pertain to local 18, local 18, but something that was said, and I feel I just want to correct it. Um, uh, Vice President Greco brought up the fact that 70% of EMS has less than five years on the job. And, and that, is, um, that is very uh, telling of uh, the dangers out there for the people of the city because EMS is emergency medical, is a science of emergency medicine. And that takes years to develop the experience needed to understand what's going on with a patient medically or trauma-wise. To have somebody with no experience, and this is not just me saying this, there's numerous studies that show the, the, the survival rate increases and the patient outcome is, uh, increases better with the, it's, its correlation with the experience related to the EMT or paramedic. The more experience they have, the better that happens. I want to correct some testimony I've heard that it was almost voiced as, a, as if it's a privilege for EMS to be so-called promoted into fire. We don't consider that a privilege. In fact, it's a burden. And it's an insult to say EMS, it's a promotion to fire. It may be a transfer, but firefighting is the science of fire suppression. EMS is the science of emergency medicine. These are two separate professions. I would not, I think it's an injustice to call it a promotion to fire. It is hindering EMS's ability because of the pay disparity to keep people in EMS because people are literally left with the decision of I want to feed my family and live a life where I'm not struggling to put food on the table. So I have to go to fire so I can earn $110,000 a year or stay in EMS and go get welfare because my top pay is $50,000 a year. It's, it's really um, taking away all the resources from EMS and not doing a justice, just, not just to our members, but to the people of this city. They need it, they deserve, they pay enough taxes, they deserve the best medical uh, uh, emergency care they could get when they call 911. And it's a shame that New York City, many considered capital of the world, can't do that or won't fix that problem. Thank you. And, 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 and we agree, we've also, obviously, that, and they continue to exasperate and perpetuate this myth of, of, of equity. Um, when, they, when we ask for information about attrition, and they, they don't include those that are being promoted, so-called promoted, right? <laughs> exactly. But then, listen, we've, I, I think that, I know almost what you know, <laughs> having tackled this for the past three or four years, and, and, and this council is going to continue to be relentless on, on these pay equity issues, um, because we all have endured, if you look at the member of, of, this, of, 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 the, of this committee that, that sat here, whether they were in or out, um, they were all uh, uh, represented, representative of communities that were underserved and undercompensated um, by, by, the, by, by the city. And, and we've, we say time and time again that we have legislated and created policy that, that dictates behavior around the EEO and uh, uh, for private sector and, and, and many others. but you know, we haven't been able to clean the house and, and we want to make sure that internally that we are doing justice to, to the over 300,000 uh, women and men that, that make the city great, that 
There's a reason why 65 million people come here. There's a reason why Amazon and Google and other folks want to set up shop here. Mm -hmm. All the bad things they say about our municipal workforce is precisely that reason, right? Obviously, you know, I have an affinity for transportation that they pound us every day, but there is no other 24-hour transportation system that provides what they provide. There is no other skilled uh, uh, EMS um, services that, that provide the level of services that are being provided here and being challenged on a daily basis uh, with eight and a half million folks. It, it just doesn't happen. And, and our public servants, uh, they answer the call on a daily basis and, and we should compensate them accordingly. And, and that means that we understand that there's some inherent differences, but it's time for us to fill those gaps. And, and, and that's what this is about here and, and providing the tools to do so. No excuses, we've gotten beyond that. That's why today wasn't about relitigating pay equity. It was about addressing local law 18, whether or not it was being complied with and what do we do moving forward. And so we, we're just committed to, uh, to pay equity. Uh, the, and, and I wanna thank my, my colleague um, for being here, for asking to, to join in and be a part of this. Uh, uh, her, her knowledge uh, is, and is, is just is, is keen and it's uh, necessary um, as we move forward with this. And um, struggle continues, but mm -hmm. we're here with you. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, hearing is officially adjourned.